Hello, welcome back to the Sam Ellis Academy. My name's Sam. Today, we're dealing with polarity, electronegativity, and then we're dealing with intermolecular forces. Without wasting any time, let's get into polarity and electronegativity. Okay, so electronegativity. We brushed past it in the last video. We talked about how it can be used to distinguish between ionic and covalent bonds. But now, in this video, like I said I was going to, I'm going to paint the full picture. AQA define it as the power of an atom to attract electrons in a covalent bond. So get that written down on a flashcard. That's the thing you've got to remember for two marks in the exam. But you do also need to understand it to a certain extent. I think that definition is completely useless by itself. So we're going to deal with some understanding now. All right. So what you need to realize is that different atoms like electrons, so to speak, more than others. Electrons are more attracted to some atoms than others. This is down to a number of factors. Uh, they include atomic radius, nuclear charge, and shielding, the stuff we've already discussed in earlier videos, but it's not limited to them. But that's not the important part. Back in the late 1800s, this concept was discussed and written down. Chemists understood the fact that some atoms had a bigger attraction to electrons than others. But it took until 1930. 32 to make electronegativity a quantitative property. He developed a scale. The lowest value on the scale is 0.79 and the highest is 3.98. Every atom is assigned one of these numbers and the higher the number, the higher the electronegativity of an atom. The lowest value 0.79 is assigned to cesium. It's in the bottom corner of the table. 3.98 is fluorine's electronegativity value. And in general, the closer you get to fluorine, the more electronegative an atom is. If we have an atom that likes electrons more than the one it's covalently bonded to, i.e. is more electronegative, it's going to pull the electrons closer to it. As the definition says, the power of an atom to attract electrons in a covalent bond. The best way to think of it is like a tug of war. You've got two atoms that we're going to represent with two people. A more electronegative one and a less electronegative one. The more electronegative is going to be a six foot ten body Builder, and the other atom is going to be a normal person. The rope is going to represent the covalent bond and the tie in the middle is going to be the pair of electrons. As soon as we take this from a static situation and they start pulling, the more electronegative atom is going to pull the electrons closer. In other words, the stronger guy is going to pull the tie closer to him. And if you think about that in terms of atoms, it means something like this happens. If we draw here hydrogen fluoride, where fluorine is obviously way more electronegative than hydrogen, being the most electronegative atom, if we put roughly where the electrons would exist, it's going to be way closer to fluorine. Now, what does that mean? We know electrons are negative. If fluorine's pulling these electrons closer to itself, in turn further away from hydrogen, then fluorine is going to be slightly negative and hydrogen is going to be slightly positive. This little symbol I've drawn is called delta. It's the Greek letter D. In maths and science, it represents change. You can also think of it meaning the word slightly. So one end is slightly positive and one end is slightly negative. If we have a situation like this one, where the bond is made of two different atoms with a difference in electronegativity, you have a polar bond. Hydrogen fluoride is polar because fluorine is more electronegative negative than hydrogen, it pulls the electrons closer, so one end is slightly positive and one end is slightly negative. If we have a covalent bond like the one between two iodine atoms in an iodine molecule, there's obviously no difference in electronegativity, so by default it's not a polar bond. Something that needs to be brought to your attention though is a situation like this. We'll take the molecule tetrachloromethane where we've got carbon and four chlorine atoms. If we zoom in on the carbon to chlorine bond, it's obvious that it's polar because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. But if we zoom out again, there's four carbon to chlorine bonds, all of them being equally polar. So on the whole, this molecule is actually not polar. The four bonds have cancelled it out. So carbon to chlorine is a polar bond, but because of the structure of this molecule, you can see it's not polar. In the A-level, these situations are quite easy to spot. It's not something you need to be too worried about. If you understand polarity and why it exists, every example AQA throw at you, you'll be able to spot. All right, so we've covered polarity and how it links to electronegativity. I want you to hold the idea of polarity in your mind because it's the basis that intermolecular forces is built on. So now we're going to use the idea we've just learned and talk about intermolecular forces. First though, let's look at the word intermolecular. What does it actually mean? If you take the word inter, you can think of it like intercity or international. It means the same thing that between does. Between cities or between nations is the same as saying intercity or international. Molecular means we're talking about molecules. Put the words together, you've got between molecule forces. And that is exactly what intermolecular forces are. They're forces between molecules. Not within, but between. A covalent bond is within a molecule. An intermolecular force is between these molecules. There's three classifications of these forces between molecules in chemistry. There's van der Waal forces, dipole-dipole intermolecular forces, and the slightly confusingly named hydrogen bonding. VDW forces are known as London forces, sometimes even known as temporary dipoles. Dipole-dipole forces are also known as permanent dipole forces. Hydrogen bonding only got one name. The order I just said them in is the order of increasing strength. We're now going to work through that order and explain the differences and why those differences exist. 
We'll start with Van der Waals forces. As I said, these are also called London forces, and the name that makes the most sense, in my opinion, is induced the dipole forces. One thing to get clear is that Van der Waals forces are present between all molecules. What I'm going to do is draw an iodine molecule. We know this iodine molecule is not polar because both the iodine atoms have got the same electronegativity, so the electrons will roughly exist in the middle of the covalent bond. What I've drawn here is what you'd expect to be true, but it's a bit of a lie because electrons are obviously not static. They move around all the time. They exist almost like clouds of charge around the molecule. At any given time, an iodine molecule might look like this, where one end's got more electrons than another. And if we think about what we just talked about in terms of electrical charge on a polar molecule, a similar thing's happening here, just to a lesser extent. One end, again, is gonna be slightly negative and one's gonna be slightly positive. So we get a temporary dipole. This is what holds a big group of iodine molecules together. Something important about van der Waals forces is that the bigger the molecule gets, the more electrons there are. So therefore, the bigger get the van der Waals force of attraction is. This graph I've just whacked on the screen shows the trend in melting and boiling point as you go down group seven. As you'd expect, it increases because as you go down, another shell of electrons is added on and the size of the molecules increases. So van der Waals forces, they're holding non-polar molecules together thanks to temporary deficiencies and richness of electrons at either end. Now we need to think about forces between polar molecules, dipole, dipole, intermolecular forces. In this situation, the polarity is more pronounced than in a non-polar molecule. That means the attraction between the negative end of one molecule and the positive end of another is greater. And that means, if you think about it, that the melting and boiling point of a similar sized molecule will be higher than a non-polar van der Waals force alternative. If we look at chlorine and compare its boiling point to something similar in size, but polar, like chloromethane, you can see the boiling point's actually higher on the slightly smaller, yet polar molecule. Finally, hydrogen bonding. This is essentially a special case of dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. If there's a bond between hydrogen and either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, it's the strongest type of intermolecular force you can have. Hopefully, you can deduce by yourself why this is the case now. Those three atoms are the three most electronegative atoms out there, and therefore, one end of a molecule will be extremely negative, and the other will be extremely positive. A classic example that you'll see in everyday life where hydrogen bonding exists is water, because you've got oxygen bonded to two hydrogen atoms to make a water molecule. Water is a smaller molecule than chlorine but its boiling point is 100 degrees higher, and that just shows you how strong a hydrogen bond is. One thing that I need to probably say explicitly is the reason that the boiling point increases with the strength of the intermolecular force is because for something to boil, you need to overcome the intermolecular forces. The stronger the force, the more energy that is required to overcome the intermolecular force. You need to be able to draw hydrogen bonding out on the page if you get asked it in an exam. It's worth like four marks, and there's some key features you need to include. So I'm going to draw hydrogen bonding in water and explain the features that you need to have. Here you can see between the H here at the top to the O, and then to the H at the bottom to the O, it's a complete straight line. That is because in real life, that's how the molecules will arrange themselves, in straight lines. You can see that I've labeled the delta positive and delta negative regions, the oxygen being the delta negative, the hydrogen being the delta positive. You can also see these two dots that I've put on the oxygen. These are lone pairs of electrons, essentially non-bonded pairs. Lone pairs and non-bonding pairs of electrons are interchangeable phrases. The force is represented, as you can see, by a dashed line. It can be dashes like this or dashes like this. There's no real preference. Just do whatever you want. And you know what? Just like that, we've covered everything you need to know about polarity, electronegativity, and intermolecular forces at A level. This is really a topic where the knowledge is limited, but the application's quite great. So visit the website and have a go at the past exam questions AQA have asked. As always, I've been Sam from the Sam Ellis Academy, and I'm expecting to see you in the next video. Goodbye. Thank <music> you.